Welcome to the new. Every experience with God's Word promises to be refreshing and transformational. Receive today's message with high expectations as it brings power, light, and a fresh anointing to your life. All right, for the past three weeks now, we've started teaching on um, our foundational doctrinal um, teachings. Um, and if you've not listened to any of those series, even if you are here physically or you are joining online, I'd like to encourage you to go back and listen to it again because it's going to help you understand, all right, the things that we are talking about and the things that we are teaching. Turn it down a little bit. Turn it down a little bit. And the things that, you know, I've been teaching and we... Um, I've been communicating. Now, let me just say this here as a way of foundation. Uh, A lot of times, believers come to church and only practice what they see other people practice without truly understanding why they are doing what they are doing. Now, I found so many times that it's spiritual things that the question why is sometimes exempted. God is not against you asking questions. And God is not against us having understanding of what and what it is we are doing. I'll give a very good example. If I say, everyone stand on your feet and give God a shout. Now, You shouldn't at that moment say, why are we giving God a shout? You should practice it by doing what I've said. But you must go back and study what is the spiritual significance of shouting and rejoicing or being joyful. If I say, um, run, or I say, begin to dance in the Holy Ghost, or even to the little thing as praying in the spirit we don't ask why the bible says that we should study to show yourself approved so that you can have a right understanding as to what exactly it is that you are doing and so there are many things in the bible that a lot of believers just do it without any form of understanding So if we say give, because we see everybody go outside to give, we just give. And now it's okay, it's good. But you see, you will not enjoy the benefits in the fullness if you don't have the understanding as to why you are doing what you are doing. The moment understanding is lost, you are only doing what other person is doing without understanding why it is supposed to be done. And that's why it's very critical. Understanding is so pivotal, it's so important that we understand particularly your foundational doctrines. And that's why for the next one month again, we'll just take time to soak it, to teach it, to teach it, to teach it so that you have understanding. Amen. Amen. Do you have your Bibles yet? Yes, sir. Do you have your writing material? Yes, sir. Can we dive right into it? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Yes, All right. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Let's go back to our anchor scripture for these teachings. Just increase it a little bit. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 16. Amen. Okay. That sound is, is disturbing us here. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. I said verse 16. Verse 1. Let's go. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, go. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Next verse. Of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now, last week we taught on repentance of dead works. Yes or no? And so this week now we move to faith 
towards God. So our teaching focus today is the second line item, go back to the preceding verse, verse 1, the second line item in this foundational Christian doctrines, which is faith towards God. This part is what we are going to be focused on this evening, faith towards God. Now, I'm going to be teaching this from a different perspective, all right, not from what most of you are expecting. Because the moment you saw faith towards God in the flyer, your mind was just going to, yes, an opportunity whereby I'm going to know God a little bit better, particularly on how to get something from him. Now, the teachings of faith in the body of Christ has largely been centered around receiving something from God. Now, let me say this a little bit more further. Whenever you hear a teaching on faith, it is very likely that the emphasis of that teaching borders solely or most no let me let me just say that word borders largely on the way you should know God and how to get something from God and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing biblically wrong with that but you see there are many other sides of the use of faith beyond just receiving something from God now I want to say a few things here. The Bible says that whatsoever is not done in faith is sin. Let's open that scripture. Romans chapter 14 verse 23. It says, whatever is not done by faith is sin. It says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. You see, this subject of faith is a foundation of our Christian theology. It helps you understand the basis of how to believe in God, how to work with God, how to have insight with God, how to understand God, how to understand his ways, how to understand his thinking. Faith is that foundation. That's why the Bible says that the just man shall live by faith. Another explanation of what that means is the justified man shall live by faith. So the way you live on the surface of this earth is not by sight, it's by faith. In fact, when you look at the first attributes and the actions of the Godhead in Genesis chapter 1, you see that it was a life of faith. God who called those things that be not as though they were faith. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God that he that comes to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Faith. Now, most of us, we understand the subject of faith to a degree. But we see faith solely from the perspective of how to receive from God. Now, let me say this here. It means that everything you do in church or your Christian practice that is not done by faith is a waste. Oh, let me explain it for that. It means that your serving God without doing it by faith is a waste of time. Because the just shall live, not the just shall get by faith alone. The just shall live. Serving God is part of living. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We give in church, yes or no? You give your tithe, you give your offering. Is that part of your living? So if you do all of those activities without the faith sickle in it, it's a waste of it also. The just shall live. The fullness of a just man's life is done through the spectrum of faith. Amen. But there are different aspects of faith. There is faith receiving from God. I wrote it here. And there is also faith in the receiving, faith receiving from God. Number two, faith in the ways of God. So there's one thing about faith from receiving from God. But what about our faith in the ways of God? One good example of faith in the ways of God is when you are in the peace, is still God. Faith in the ways of God. Faith in the doings of God. You are God alone for the four times begun in the good times and bad. Faith in the ways. The ways doesn't mean that it has to favor you. Glory to God. But faith in that way. Though he slay me, yet I will praise him. Faith in the ways of God. Are you seeing that? You see, that teaching has been removed from the curriculum of the believers. It's only the faith of receiving we focus on. But there's a faith in the ways of God. There is also what we call faith in doing the will of God. <laughs> That's the one when he says, go and, suffer, go and sacrifice Isaac. 
your only the same person he promised you after how many years of waiting he then says go and sacrifice him faith in the will of God but we don't really teach that we don't teach that old rugged cross like we used to teach and we used to hear in the 90s that old way of denial deny oneself don't take it though it's good God says don't take it faith in doing the will of God and so today I want to focus on the second part which is faith in the ways of God open with me to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16 Galatians 2 16 Galatians 2 and verse 16 thank you Lord thank you Jesus hallelujah all right let's read it together one two ready I read knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Christ Jesus even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ Jesus and not by works of the law for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified faith in what Christ Jesus it means that if Jesus is leading you beside the still water is still a walk of faith and if the same Jesus is leading you right in the valley of the shadow of death is still the same Jesus the faith in the Jesus of the still water must not be a different kind in the faith in the valley of the shadow many of us see faith in the will of God at this point as a loving, daring, simple beautiful, loving father you can worship and cry but the moment you enter into the valley of the shadow of death he has forsaken me, where are thou? but he's still right there with you the devil has told you when it is good, it is faith when it is bad, it is fear but I tell you, sometimes when it is bad, it's still faith faith in the will of God. Faith in knowing the ways of God. Let's look at another scripture. Romans chapter 117. Romans 117. Somebody shout amen. amen. It says, For it is the righteousness of God that it reveals from faith to faith as it is written. Let's chorus this together. One, two, three, go. The just shall live by faith. Now, quickly, so that we can move ahead, because we have a lot of things to, to, to teach today. The concept of faith was predicated on something which is the covenant between God and man. Now, that's a whole teaching and I hope that the Holy Spirit will give us a permission this year to really cover, you know, the covenant, the teaching on covenant. And when I do epignosis um, with Ikeja, and I'm going to be doing that across all the new installations, um, I will touch a little bit on it. Well, maybe a little bit deeper on it. I'm going to be teaching on the laws, the laws of Moses, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and all of that. But I, I want to brush a little bit on covenant because you see, the reason why we have faith in God is not because God is just God. So we have faith in him because it's just God. We have faith because of something that has been initiated that he cannot go back on. And that something is covenant that is swore by himself, through himself, and for himself, for us. The Bible says by two imitable team, it is impossible for God to lie. And so our faith is predicated on what he has sworn. Meaning that the day he says he's no longer doing it, he must die. And God is not a man that he cannot die. So when we have faith, you see, this is the statement that... David made when he went to Goliath. He says, who art thou, O uncircumcised Philistine? He knew his covenant. Now, the Bible called that covenant that David operated in, in the old covenant. He says, we then have a better covenant upon better promises. And so we understand that our subject of faith, what we stand on when you think of faith, is the covenant that God has with you. That's why that covenant was not made between God and man. I don't have time to show you that. If you look at it with what happened with Abraham, it wasn't God and Abraham. It was God and God. 
because if you want to cut covenant with somebody the way it is done is that is either you are equal that's why you can do covenants together if someone who in the old days when they used to fight battles if your family is a warrior and another family of farmers they two come together and say let's do it this way I have farming products and let's call a covenant I would always supply food to your family and you would just ensure the other family is maybe the warrior you would always ensure that we are protected what would they do they'll cut blood they'll put a testator they'll put somebody there who observed the process and the procedure and they, they drink of the blood in that moment they've entered into a covenant you must always supply food to me and you must always protect me when the enemy comes but how would God cut covenant with man because they are not on the same level so he had to get to a point to cut the covenant with himself not with man and God is not a man that he should lie so he cannot fall down the covenant so that is how we stand on faith because we know that if he has said it and he will are you getting my point now in Jeremiah chapter 33 Jeremiah 31 Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Somebody say, I hear. I hear. Are you ready to go a little bit deeper? Yes, sir. I can hear you louder. Yes, sir. Jeremiah 31 and 31. Glory to God. It says, Behold. You know, I've taught you this before. Pause, look, and see. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. When I will make a new, underline that word, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Next verse. It says, not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in the day that I took them from the head by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt by covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Next verse, verse 33. But this is the covenant that I would make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my what? Law in their minds. Underline that word, laws in their minds. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. Next verse, verse 34. No man shall... Okay, go back to that preceding verse. Now, watch this. Let me give you a perfect example of what you understand me because you see most time when people read the scripture I've heard a lot of believers say that the moment we got born again then the understanding of the word of God the epignosis of the word is now in our spirit and so you don't need anybody to teach you anything anymore it's already in your spirit because the law has been put in your spirit already many people believe that so what people believe is that you don't need to go after any knowledge again now let's understand the premise upon which this was told a very good example is this uh let me have that water that water bottle or that water no 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 no, no, it's too far just come thank you watch this now you see this water here i'm not branding any company you see this water right here when God says I will put my law in their what minds it means that this water the bottle is empty if there's no water inside the moment I put water inside the bottle is filled with water now if I want to make coffee very hot coffee in a, in a very cold weather the way this water is right now, can I use it? What do I have to do? Boil it. Yes or no? If I want to drink very cold water, chilled water, ice water, what do I have to do with it? I put it in the room. Depending on how I want to use it, I must apply myself either to the cold or to the hot. The water is there. But the application, you must take it to... Are you getting what I'm saying there? So it is in your spirit, but you must find the flame inside there. Which is the concept of knowledge. So this scripture does not exempt from the knowledge of the law. Are you getting what I'm saying? That is why 
when a pastor begins to teach you like I'm teaching you now, the moment I'm speaking, I say something you've not heard before, but you say, wow, wow. But you understand it. It's not as though you have not heard it before. It's somewhere in your spirit. But when I say it, it clicks something in your spirit. Say, so that is that thing. It's like it was somewhere before, then it came up top. Does that happen to you? So the word of God is in your spirit. That's why anointed teacher brings it from the reservoir of where it is to the top level knowledge that you can now use it. Because it's of no good if it's there, residual, and you can do nothing with it. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why you must always expose yourself to the word. Because it moves from a level and comes to revelation. The moment it's on letter level, it's of no good. The moment it moves from letter to light, then you can use it. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the covenant understanding of faith towards God in our doctrinal understanding is in your spirit. But I want to help you to apply it now. Did you get it? So let's enter into the application of it. Yesterday, thank you, we had come out with a flyer. The, the, the fact, the theme for today was supposed to be faith and baptism. If you look at it according to the order. As of this morning, when I saw the flyer, I called um, PV and I said, since last night I've been feeling in my spirit that I need to teach extensively on giving. And it's very connected to faith towards God because it's one of the prerequisites in your faith life with God. And I said that I felt compelled by the Spirit of God to help do a little bit of extensive teaching on the subject of tithing especially so that the saints can understand kingdom practice so that you are not just coming to do thanksgiving service and dropping offering without knowing you know what I'm saying people just do what they see no knowledge they just practice what they saw their parents do their forefather do the God of Moses the God of Joshua who is it to you but if you don't have an understanding, you'll just continue to do. So let's teach from the scriptures. Let's understand it line upon line, precept upon precept, faith towards God, particularly when it comes to giving. Are you ready now? Are you ready? So let's get into the word. Genesis. You know, I told you that the book of Genesis is the book of the beginnings. Precept in Hebrew, which means the foundations, which means the beginnings which means the original intentions. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, and let's read from verse 8. Genesis chapter 2, and verse 8. It says, the Lord planted, a, are you all there? It says, the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden have you noticed that all the teaching we've been doing this series we go back to Genesis you know why we go back to Genesis because Genesis is the original intention of God everything that God wanted to see on the earth was imputed in the old book of Genesis I tell you if you really want to understand the Bible very well you go back to Genesis and read it well so let's see that even in the Garden of Eden, there was giving and there was receiving in that place. Let me show you. When the Lord opened my eyes to this thing, it's deeper than, you see, because everything, you know, in the Bible, there are things that are called the obvious. But there are things that are there, but the Holy Spirit needs to show you for it to be seen to you that is right there. But they are all principles laid up in the Word of God. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. Next verse. Verse 9. Let's go to verse 15. Verse 15. Verse 15. All right. Fantastic. Then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? what? Say it again. One more time. Now, you know, say, 
if you are in the kitchen and you are frying plantain or you are frying meat you have the permission because you must taste and see that it is good yes or no so that's why our wives and the women they always taste the food before the men because they would have because they are the ones operating it so when God says that man should tend and keep the garden he had the permission to taste because now from where you they walk correct so he could taste it from it but before that verse you saw that God had told him don't eat out of these three trees we don't need to go back there we talked about it two three weeks ago yes or no he had three of them trees there he had the tree of good and the knowledge of evil we had the normal fruit that was present to the site he had then the, also the tree of life he could eat out of those but he couldn't eat out of the two that was there now let's go to Genesis 8 2 pardon me Genesis 2 and verse 8 Genesis 2 and verse 8 and we're going to read all the way to verse 10 Genesis 2 verse 8 are you there okay look at your Bible then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put man whom he had formed and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil right now look at verse 10 let's pause in verse 10 so this is what happened God took them man and put him in the garden and says everything you see in this garden tend to it attend to it grow it name them build it enjoy it but you see this tree this two year you can touch out of it this two year is reserved for me I've given you everything else everything else you can eat to stupor but you see this too is consecrated for me this too is mine don't touch it even though I have put you in the garden even though I've blessed you with everything but you see these two trees right here it's concentrated only for me you cannot touch it of course we know the story Adam went over, Eve, pardon me, took of it and ate of it. If you read Genesis chapter 3 and verse 23 in the head, you see that God then sent them out of the garden. Why? Let me explain something to you. We know from the Bible, 1 John 3, that God is love. But you see, there are two concepts of love that we must understand. That love does not only give love is also open to receive oh follow me closely so I'll give an example here my wife and I are married right here just imagine everything about our relationship is me always giving her giving 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 and she's never given me anything before she's never given me anything before now listen to this this is very important that even when it comes to praise God receives it and so you see that in as much as we say that our God is lavishous in giving God also there are certain things he wants to receive and so listen to this the first time we saw the concept of tithes in the Bible was from the man Abraham but the principles of keeping certain things only to God was seen in the book of Genesis in the life of Abraham and Eve. You could see that very clear with what God said to them with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the flower and the plantings that they had. He says, You can eat out of every other thing, but you see this one. Don't touch of it. You see, this is how God can bless you. He can bless you with finances, He can keep you in Eden with the midst of all the good things. But then he says to you, out of everything I've given you, you can eat it. I gave you a good job. It's all yours. Enjoy the job. I gave it to you anyway. But you see, there are certain things that are concentrated or consecrated for me. 
Keep that thing for me. Is somebody following what I'm talking about here? Keep it for me. Don't touch it. Don't eat of it. It's mine. So you see that. That it's not everything God blesses you with that is yours. Let me tell you something. Listen to this very closely. Some people said that God tempted Adam and Eve. No, God didn't. Tempt. God never tempts. He didn't tempt Adam and Eve. The reason why the tree was in the garden was not to tempt them, was to teach them how to obey Him. Oh my goodness! Did you hear what I just said there? Because the principle of life was supposed to be that man will continue the human race and they will learn how to obey him. So it was not a temptation for Adam and Eve. It was a learning process on how to submit to the lordship and the rulership of Christ and God, pardon me, so that they can learn how to obey him. So everything in our lives that God has given to us is watching close. Is he or she obeying me? What I've given to her. So the first thing you see there, the principles of God reserving certain things first to himself was found in the book of Genesis. You can't touch this. You can have every other thing. But you see this one. You see this one. It's my own. Leave it for me. Now, the first time in the Bible, because I don't want to hurry this teaching. I want to go it one after the other. The first time in the Bible that we then saw the actual given in the Bible was from Genesis chapter 4, which was the seeds of Adam and Eve. And it's the story that we call Cain and Abel's story. Now watch this. You need to understand this, that it's God that created Adam and Eve but Cain and Abel were not created they were the first born human race are you hearing what I'm saying there meaning out of reproduction that somebody came out of a womb of a woman it was from Cain and Abel Eve brought them forth first yes or no Adam and Eve were created by God but Cain and Abel came out of the womb of a woman first. And so the first thing you see of Cain and Abel was the first act of giving. In fact, it is very also important to note that with Cain and Abel, the Bible did not really waste time in talking about their personality, who they are, that they didn't really give too much background knowledge of them so much. But the first act that was recorded about them was the act of giving and receiving. Now, could it be that it was in it that man was designed to give and to receive? Think about that. Could it be that it was part of it? Now, another side of this could be could it be that as they were growing up, there's a possibility, there's a suggestion, that as they were growing up, this were part of the things that Adam and Eve, because when God made the call for it for them, they did not say no. They didn't fight or war against it. It was a natural response. So could it be that there were things that they had learned? Or could it be that there were things that they had seen? You see, if you look at both of them, Cain and Abel, you see the first act of God with man and the last act of God with man. The first act of God with Adam was take this ground and till it, which was almost like farmer work. The last act of God with man was God killing an animal and putting a tunic in the body of Adam and Eve, which was almost like what you call cattle rearing and killing an animal, which is like a cow for it, a lamb, and putting there. So the occupation of Cain and Abel fit into the first act of God and also the last act. Are you following me? Are you missing me? Are you getting it? So, we had Cain and Abel. The first time we saw first fruits in the Bible 
was from Cain and Abel. I'm not going to teach on that so deeply today, but I will touch it next week because I want to eat on that tight matter. So let's go to the scriptures. Uh, Genesis 4, verse 1. Genesis 4, verse 1. Is somebody getting something this, morning, this evening? All right, let's go there. Genesis 4 and verse 1. Somebody shout, glory to God. Let's go to verse 2. All right, you read for me. One, two, ready, and go. Verse 3. Verse 4. The firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. There's five, last one. Now, I don't want to, this is a whole teaching. There's plenty of debate on this. Why did God, you know, take Adam, um, Abel's offering and he didn't take Cain's offering, uh, you know, when we were growing up? <laughs> Our Bible's teachers, you know, who teaches you is important. <laughs> Our Bible teachers told us then that it's because they brought rotten mango, rotten baskets, rotten fruits. Say, nah, I will never give anything rotten to God, my God. I will never. Was that why God rejected him? Let me go ahead of myself a little bit. Actually, it was a principle that God was trying to establish. That God receives you first before he receives your gifts. But I don't want to go, that's not for today's teaching. All right. Now you see that. Now let's open First John chapter three and verse twelve. First John three twelve. First John three twelve. Amen. So there's so many types of giving you see in the Bible. The first one we saw was the giving of the first fruits. The first one, Cain and Abel. The giving of the first fruits. In John, First John three thirteen. Not as Cain who was a wicked one and murdered his brother. So they had already classified who Cain was. His heart was not right. It was his heart. That Cain matter was a heart matter. It says, and why did he murder his brother? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Open again with another verse of scripture. Let's lay a little bit more emphasis on this. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. Hebrews 11 and verse 4. But faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a more what? Excellent sacrifice. Underline that word excellent because we'll go back there. Than Cain, though he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and though it he being dead, you speaking. Now what does verse 4, 4, keep it there. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent Sacrifice that came. Now let's go back to that excellent sacrifice so that we can understand what we're talking about there. Hebrews, um, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 3. Genesis 4, verse 3. I said I don't want to waste more time on this one, but let me just touch it quickly. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering from the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Next verse, verse 4. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. Now, when we use the word flock, are we talking about more than one? It's a group of. Now, you need to understand that Abel at this time probably had many flocks. Now, if you say that he brought the firstborn of his flock, there are many firstborns of the flocks. Yes or no? Because if he gives birth to one, another one will meet another one and they will give birth to... So there will be many firstborns, not just one firstborn. So when the Bible says that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, it was not talking about one flock that he just brought out or one animal he just brought out. The firstborn, so if he had 3,000 animals, how many firstborn would he have out of that? The number of the firstborn he had was what he brought out before God. Now think about this. 
if we brought out those numbers before God, the Bible now laid a little bit of emphasis. It says, and they are fats. So it was not some lean, dead firstborn. He said, that one, a firstborn, bring them. Do you know that's how many of us are giving to God? Your firstborn to 1K. Your firstborn lean, not fat, lean. Just put them. But look at, there is a response in the Godhead when they give. See, think about this this way. God was going to bed one night. Then all of a sudden, one incense was born and he looked with one eye. He saw that it was Solomon who gave a thousand prophets. God, just wake up. Say, hey, eh, you gave this. What do you want? Let me tell you something. In the covenant, there are certain things that provoke God. Yes. But we'll enter into that teaching. Not today. Let's give that will be next week. Because we must understand you, your giving must make sense from today. So you see, you see the, the mind through which the worship through which Abel gave the sacrifice. Not only that, his heart also was right. And you can see his brother. So I have to run. So the first act of giving, you see in the Old Testament or in the beginning of creation was not with Adam and Eve. The first principle was layered with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when God said, eat of everything but don't touch. The separation of a few for him, the act of giving. But the first act of giving from a man born was who? Cain and Abel. The second act of giving that you see in the Bible was layered almost immediately in Genesis chapter 8. And who was that? The man Noah. The Bible says Noah found grace and the sight of God. Let's go to Noah. I said Noah. Genesis chapter 8. Verse 20. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. Genesis chapter 8. Verse 20. Did you notice a principle that when God was creating the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and creating all the animals, he only created male and female. The purpose was for seed time and harvest. So the law was already embedded in the system of the earth from the very foundation of the earth. The law of seed time and harvest, it was already there. Now, let's keep going. Genesis chapter 8, 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Now, this, at this time, Noah had finished building the ark. Look at what he did. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird. Are you seeing the description? Somewhat similar to the behavior of Abel. Did you see that? It says, and every clean animal and every clean bird and offered what? Burnt offerings on the altar. Another version puts it this way, and offered bond sacrifice. So the act of sacrifice that you saw, what we call sacrificial seeds, was then seen in Genesis chapter 8. That was the next act, types of seeds that you saw in the Bible. He gave bond. Now watch what happened afterwards. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. You see something similar to what happened with Cain and Abel. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma that the Lord said to his heart, in his heart, I would never again curse the ground for man's sake. Though the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every... Will I again destroy... Ah. Will I again destroy every living thing as I have done before? Next verse, verse 22. Which is chapter 11, chapter 9 now. Go to chapter 9 now. Chapter 9. Now look at what happens there. No, go back to 22. 22. Look at the principle that was then set in motion. When God said, I'm never going to, I'm never going to destroy man again. But a principle was then set in motion that from today man would destroy themselves if they don't do this principle. Are you following what I'm saying here? What is the principle? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and winter, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease so a law was reenacted because somebody gave God said I'm never going to destroy the earth again but I'm going to set in motion what would make people pick a choice you destroy yourself or you exempt yourself I will set it in motion but me destroy anymore no more 
But this law would operate by itself that anyone who stays in the right part of the law, it will work for them. Are you following what I'm saying here? Go to chapter 9. So you see sacrifice. That's why some people's family, you see it in chapter 9. So God blessed Noah and what? Was the sons there when they gave this thing? So you see how people can rot covenants for their children's children. Can you see? That some people's children will be blessed because of Abraham's sake. Because of Shola's sake. You are not saying your own. <laughs> and, if, and God blessed Noah and what? His sons. I said to them, the same words he spoke to Adam in the beginning was the same words he altered to him. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now to the crux of my teaching. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, which is where we then saw the first act of titan and the third act of giving in the Bible. Are you following me? And that is the concept of titan. Now, children of God, this is one of the most attacked, bastardized. It looks as though, and I say this with all humility to the body of Christ, because I truly love the body of Christ. We truly failed in our assignment that a group of people, personalities, and men can say one thing and shake us because the last percentage of people don't know the God that they serve, yet they call Yahweh my God. And so somebody will wake up, I tell you the truth, in a generation to come and say, man is no longer man, man is now woman. And we are going to be debating on that. Is it man or woman? Is it man or woman? Is it man or woman? Why? Because most of the things people know were what people told them. Not what they searched. He said, search the scriptures. In it are written, search the scriptures. That's why it is very important for you to see these things by yourself. And that's why in church, when we say read the scripture, I always encourage you, open it yourself and see it. So that it creates a hook in your spirit that always wants you to go back to see it again. So one man just came from nowhere, especially in Nigeria, and shook everybody. We're now debating. People who were tight as before, just... Churches that used to say tight, they coined the name. Now they've all come back because the guy has left them. When he wakes up three weeks' time, he says, Bruce, everybody says, it's true. You know why? There is a deficiency of teaching priests and discipled men in the body of Christ. And once there is a deficiency of those things in the body, we pay dearly for it. Our ignorance moves from top bottom level to topmost level and is seen to all the men. And those in hell are laughing. Like, look at, we just said tight. They are already shaking. Okay, now we have more, more things to come for them. That is why we must learn and understand the scriptures. So that your faith and your covenant, because when the devil comes after you, it's not after you, it's after the covenant. Your understanding of your rights. So let's look at this scripture one after the other. If I don't finish today, I will continue next week. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. We're going to read it all the way down together. And I am going to take it one after the other. Genesis 14 and let's start from verse 18. Just to put a little bit of background knowledge for you on that scripture. This was uh, Abraham who had gone to fight to get back his son, his, his, his um, cousin, or nephew, Lot. Because Lot has too much problem. <laughs> and Lot is a lot. <laughs> you know. So he went to rescue him back. And then in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, he then faced Lot, um, uh, what's the name? Melchizedek. So let's read the scripture so that we can have an understanding of who this Melchizedek, because we are always talking about Melchizedek. You know, when we were growing up, there are two people in the Bible we all knew, Methuselah and Melchizedek. But some of us don't even understand Melchizedek. We just say, and eh, he's like Jesus. How? 
is he like Jesus? What is the role of Melchizedek? What does he play in the order? Are you getting what I'm saying? So let's check it out now. Let's read this scripture first and then we'll go to the next verse. Um, Genesis 14 verse 18. Let's go there. Genesis 14. Someone shout, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All the way to verse 18. All right, let's read. Everybody look at your Bible and read together. One, two, three, go. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out wine, bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20. And blessed he be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the person and take the goods for yourself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hands to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I would take nothing from a tread of a sandal strap, that I would not take anything that is yours, lest you shall say, I have made Abraham rich. Verse 24, except only that the young man, I'm the only one reading. I portion. Now, some of the debates about this titan issue was some teachings that I believe infuriated some people. Christians, believers, unbelievers. With every sense of humility and honor and respect, you hear some teachings that almost move from faith to fear. And so, if you don't tight, your life will be tight. <laughs> if you don't tight, the devourer is knocking at your door. You know the one at the kitchen door? He has left the front door of your house. It's right at the kitchen door. He's knocking. And so some people became angry. And said, no, no, no. I'm not tightening and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm getting money. So do I have to tight? Listen, it is the most, go and check it out. Statistics shows that it is one of the most silent questions in the heart of every believer. This title matter. That's why people do it today and don't do it next week, next month. They are not sure. Now, there is no way you would understand the concept of Titan without going back to what I taught you on Sunday three weeks ago, which was the order of Jacob and his sons, which were the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, follow me now. Show me that image. Fantastic. How many of you remember this image? Now, we'll focus on this guy. Which is the Levi. Now we understand that this Levi, when Jacob was blessing them, him and Simon, which was the third guy, third born, he did not give any portion to why? Because they were angry people. In fact, he gave them a curse. And said, Because of your anger, da, 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 da. go and read it. Genesis chapter 49. I asked you all to go read it. These two guys, he didn't give them anything in the portion of the whole of Israel. However, he made a proclamation also on the Levi that the Levitical household would be the priestly household that would represent the whole of Israel. And so they are not going to get any portion or allocation of lands, but they are going to get the tithes that come from every of these people to live their lives. And so everybody in Israel were compelled to bring their tithes to this guy. Why? Because the anointing of the priesthood was upon them. And of course we know about Moses, we know about Aaron. In fact, if you want to be in the priestly robe and the priestly family, you come from the tribe of Aaron. That's the Aaron, you know, tribe, which is also the Levitical. Now, I really, you know, you have it right here, the Levites, the priest, and the high priest. And the high priest comes from Aaron. Now, let's look at some scriptures. Because there is what we call the Levitical order of Titan and the Melchizedek order of Titan. The fact, don't let me go ahead of myself. The Levitical order of Titan and what we call the 
Melchizedek order of Titan. Because people are saying, well, there's no Titan in the New Testament now. How come they are saying we should tithe? At least the Titan has passed with the Old Testament. Are you asking us to now start doing what was done in the Old Testament, now with the New Testament? Titan is over. At least Jesus never said anything about Titan. We will see it here today. So that you will now make your choice if you should tithe or you should not tithe. So let's look at some scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 21. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 21. Pardon me, Numbers. Numbers 18 and verse 21. And we're going to read all the way to 28. Now look at your Bible and I read. Behold, I have given the children of, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance to return for the work which they perform. And we know the work they perform is the priestly work. It says the work of the tabernacle of meeting. I have given them the tithe. So the portions of the all of the Levi family was the tithe. Now let's keep going. Next verse. It says, Here after the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. Next verse. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation, that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. Did you see that? That the Levites will have no inheritance. They have no portion of the land. So when they were allocating lands for them, they had no portion. Their own portion was to fix themselves on the tabernacle, on the tent of meeting, so that they can serve God and not lose focus. So they get a portion of tent and give them so that their service to God will not distract them. Follow me close. Let's keep going. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer us as an eighth offering to the Lord, I have given the Levite as an inheritance. You can see it in your Bible. So what did God give the Levite family? Talk to me. All right, let's keep going. I have given the Levite as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Next verse. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Next verse. I'm going to 28. No, go back to 26. Speak thus to the, to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a half offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. Next verse. Verse 27. And your half offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain of treasury floor and the fullness of the wine press. Next verse, verse 30, 28. Thus you shall also offer a half offering to the Lord from all your tithes that you receive from the children of Israel and you shall give the Lord a half offering from it to what? Aaron the priests. So go back to that word. Go back to that drawing. So the way this Levitical family lives is through the tithes. Now, in the Old Testament, the priests, which is the high priests, out of that tithe, a portion of it is for them. You know, in the Bible, there was a story about Eli and his son. Why did God get angry with them? From the meat pot. Who stole the meat from the cooking pot? Number one stole the meat. What were they supposed to do? According to the biblical order, you are not supposed to open and look. You are supposed to use the fork to just put there. Anyone your hand touches what you take by closing. But what they did was they would open and select point and key. So God said, eh, you did do point and key, Labi. So the way that Levitical leaves was through the tithes. So they bring all of those things to the storehouse and a portion of it goes to the high priest. Now, listen, I want to say something here because I teach now to the body of Christ. Listen close. The reason why people forced that tithing thing was solely because, no, not solely, partly because some doctrines and some Assemblies 
in the body of Christ still practice this which means if you gather 10 billion all right the high priest collects a percentage tenth of it so they were saying things deeper than are you getting what I'm saying they were saying things deeper they were still practicing some of these things let's keep going Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30 Leviticus 27 in fact before we go to Leviticus 27 30 let's go to Hebrews 7 5 Hebrews 7 5 Hebrews 7 verse 5 so but by the time we are done you would understand why Jesus did not come from the house of Levites he came from Judah there was a reason ah are you guys ready for this today let's go Hebrews 7 5 it says and indeed those who are the sons of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive what tithes from the people according to the law that is from their brethren though they have come from the loins of Abraham open again to Leviticus 27 verse 30 Leviticus 27 verse 30 I asked for 15 minutes of more time. Can I even have one hour? Aha, I like you guys. <laughs> Let's continue. All right. And all the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land or what? Of the fruits of the tree, it is the Lord. It is holy unto God. Next verse, verse 31. If any man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one fifth to it. Next verse. And according to the tithes of the earth of the flock, so there are different types of tithes in the Old Testament, but not for today. Of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy unto God. Next verse. He who shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanger of it, it shall be holy and shall not be redeemed. Now, let's look at Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 44. As we're going to connect the scriptures together. Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 44. Amen. Amen. Now watch this now. It says, and at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of what? So in the tabernacle of tents, there was a storehouse. So when you bring your tithes, you bring it to the storehouse. And out of the storehouse, a percentage is given to who? The high priest. But the tent of it is what you bring there. So there was a storehouse. Now watch this. To the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings. The first fruits. We thought about first fruits before. You saw that there. And the tithes. Can you see that there are two different things? Who practiced first fruits? I just taught you now. Who practiced first fruits? All right. And the tithe, and to gather into them from the fields of the city the portion specified by the law for the priest and the Levites. And for Judah rejoiced over the priest and the Levites who ministered. Okay, open to Nehemiah 13 and verse 10. Nehemiah 13 and verse 10. I were Shep, the one who sits. I also realized that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. Did you see that? This was Nehemiah speaking. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to their fields. Next verse, verse 11. So I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Next verse. Then all Judah brought the tithes. Can you see? Judah, which was not the Levitical order. All Judah brought the tithes of the grain and the new wine and the oil. Where? So, who keeps the tithes? The priests. The Levitical order. Now, if you read Malachi chapter 3 verse 7. Don't go there because I know it scares everybody. That's the most scary scripture that most believers don't like to read again but if you read Malachi chapter 3 verse 37 let's go verse 7 it says yeah the days of the father da 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 and I was next verse 
He says, will a man rob God? Yet, you have robbed me. <laughs> People, they fear when they did this. Yet, you rob, imagine God saying you rob him. <laughs> he says, yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have I robbed you in tithes and offering next verse? That's not where I'm going to. God, let's verse. I know this one scares all of you. Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, this scripture was speaking to the household of Israel. The Judah family, the Dan family, the Simon family. There is no meat, there is no food in the storehouse of the Levitical order. The priests don't have anything to eat. The house doesn't have good things to have to do what they need to do. So bring all the tithes to the storehouse. That's what it was saying here. Now, I want you to see this Levitical pattern. And let's now look at what happened with Abraham and Melchizedek. Now, pause there. Don't quickly open the scripture. I want to say this here. Some people said that Abraham, Melchizedek, tithe, da 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 da. There is no tithe in the New Testament. Let me ask you a question. What happened with Abraham and Melchizedek? Was it before the law or after the law? So it's tight in the law. <laughs> Let's go to Melchizedek. Genesis 14 verse 18. Now, you'll get it now. Because tight was not just a law thing. That's why you see that the sequence of God, he made it happen even before Moses ever brought the law. This tithe happened before Moses brought the law. So tithe wasn't based on law, though it was in the house of Levitical. Because even before the Levitical order was formed, there was Abraham. Jacob was an offspring of Abraham. It was Jacob who brought all those orders together. The Dan, the Simon, the Judah, the Judah, and all the likes. So Abraham had existed before that time, yes or no? So let's look at this guy called Melchizedek. Number one, they say that then, the, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out wine, bread and wine, and he was the high priest of God. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Let's look at something very well quickly and come back here. Hebrews chapter 7 about this guy Melchizedek. Are you getting tired? All right, let's look at this guy called Melchizedek. For Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. Next verse. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all. Look at this. First being translated a king of what? Righteousness. And then also the king of Salem, meaning what? The king of what? Peace. Who does that look like? Let's keep it. It says, without father, without mother, without geology, having neither beginning of days and end of life, but made like the Son of God, remaining a priest where? Let's go to verse 4. Now consider how this great man was to whom even the patriarch before the law before the law, the patriarch before the law gave him a thanks of his tithes. Now, let's go back to the scripture. No, we are coming back there. Let's go back to the scripture of what we read now. Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Let's start from verse 18. Let's start from verse 18. Genesis 14, 18. Amen. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out Wine, bread and wine. So let's look at the similarities between Melchizedek and Christ. Because there are Bible scholars who are still fighting that Melchizedek is not Christ. When you think of bread and wine, what comes to your mind? What was the first act of Melchizedek? Gave Abraham blessed and bread and wine before he blessed him. What were the last possessions of Christ with the disciples? Luke chapter 17 was what? Broke bread, broke took wine, take, do this in the remembrance of me. 
Let's open the scripture. Let's open the scripture. Luke 27, verse 17. Luke 27, 22, verse 17. Luke 22, verse 17. Luke 22, verse 17. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourself. Next verse, verse 18. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine unto the kingdom of God. Let's come, next verse. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. Can you see the similarity? Now, go back again to the scripture we read earlier, which is Genesis chapter 14. Let's continue our similarities between Melchizedek and Christ. Do you also notice that Melchizedek, the Bible describes him as a king and a priest. But this is an interesting thing. He was a king and a priest, but was not from the tribe of the Levitical order. Because the Levitical order had not been initiated before he came. And Jesus was not from the Levitical order. He was from the tribe of Judah. So it was exempted similarity. Now, the Bible says he was a king and a priest. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. Now he has made us what? A king and a priest. You can only make somebody a king and a priest if you are a king and a priest. In fact, even in the earthly ministry of Jesus, they could discern him that he had kingship with him. That's why when he was going to die, they called him king of the Jews. So he made us a king and a priest unto God. So he had that same two dimension. He was a king and he was a priest. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. And let's read Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1 to 9. Now, let me say something here. Let me touch a little bit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me touch a little bit about the king and the priest thing. The priesthood there talks about the Levitical order. You, you, you might have to go back and listen to this message again. Amen. The priesthood there talks about the Levitical order, the kingship there. Now, it means that he was king of Salem and priest unto God. He had to dwell oppression. It's the same way Christ is both the wisdom of God and the power of God. So when you think of kingship, you think of power. Uh, pardon me, you think of wisdom. When you think of priesthood, you think of power. So Christ was wisdom and power of God. Melchizedek, wisdom and power king and priest. Now watch this. The kingship there speaks of civil and the priesthood there speaks of spiritual sacrifice. Two dimensions. Now, when they brought Jesus and they showed him a coin, remember that story in the Bible, and they said, what should we do? He said, give unto Caesar. Think about this. He was enacting something in order. That the kingship and the priesthood there was not only your thighs to the spiritual, but even the fact that your thighs, which we call in the civil, your tax. The only difference is this, that Caesar doesn't tell you what he wants you to give him. Caesar enforces that you give him. Caesar is not like God who says, no, no, when you go and eat in any restaurant, you pay consumption what? Uh -huh. you pay V8 you, it is embedded into your system so God was also putting civic order in place oh my goodness are you getting what I'm talking about here so you would give Caesar what belongs to Caesar but you would give God what belongs to God so if you give Caesar task which is into your day to day activity into your salary that is embedded inside of it then you give Caesar because Caesar will choke you by the neck and take you to jail and close your business down and close your account balance and FRS people will close you because you are not paying tax because in Caesar it is embedded by force but for God, it was willingly. If you go back again to the beginning of the books, Genesis, that's why the tree of the northern good of evil was there. It was in the will of man. So whatever God asks anything from man, he wants you to do it at will. Not like Caesar that forces you to do it. Did you understand what I'm saying there? Not like Caesar, but many people obey Caesar because Caesar will put it at your neck to do. 
But Christ, who is then the priest, who also gets a sense, because Abraham did not only give to the Caesar side and the kingship side of Melchizedek, he gave to the two, the king and the priest. Are you following me here? So let's keep going now. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1 to 18, 19, and we'll close this up now. Hebrews 7, oh, thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 7, 1 to 19. Everyone, we have to read this together, and you need to really help me to be fast. Let's read this. Everybody, one, two, three, go. To whom? Without father, without mother, and the Son of God remains a priest continually. Next verse. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of his spoil. Now, let me say something here. The tenth of the spoil there meant that everything Abraham got in that battle, even if he got swords and weapons, he gave a tent of swords and weapons. The, the, what he gave there wasn't only animals. Everything he got, he gave a tent of it. Let's keep going. Tithes from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren. Law is of... You understand this now? Next verse. But he who is not derived from this... From Abraham and blessed who had the promise. Next verse. Now, the least is blessed of the better. Now, there are mortal men receive tithes of whom. Next verse. Even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. Next verse. Lords of his father, when Abraham. When Melchizedek, read it again, go back. For he was where? Who was in the loins of his father? Who was Je- Levi? Jacob. Yes or no? Was in the loins of his father when Abraham met him. Next verse. So you can see the exemption from the Levitical priesthood that was going on here. It was a substitution method. Let's keep going. Verse 11. The, one, two, three, go. For under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest? Next verse. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Next verse. Next verse. Then that our Lord rose from Judah, of whom nothing concerning priesthood. Next verse. And it is yet there arise another priest who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the power of what? Who brought life? Who brought life? Why is there a comparison between Christ and Melchizedek? Endless life, similar, like Christ. Let's go, let's close this up. For it testifies, you are a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Next verse. For on one. Next verse. Is that the law? No, yes, next verse. For the law. Last one. Next verse. Next verse. Hallelujah. Next verse. Next verse. verse. 
Next verse. As what? Glory to God. Next verse. Let's go on. Therefore, those who come to God through him, since he to make what? Who makes intercession for us? Who is our high priest? So you see that who receives the tithes? It's no longer the Levitical order. This is the debate. Where people say, tithe is Old Testament. Is this Old Testament? Is tithe in the Old? Listen, when Jesus was faith, let me run something. Do you know that the first act of giving we saw in the New Testament was when in Acts chapter 4, Acts 4, 37. Let's look at Acts 4, 37. I want to show you something. Woo, glory to God. Are you getting understanding here? It says, having, having lad sold it and what? Brought the money and laid it. The first act of giving. The first act of giving was not Acts chapter 3. Because the silver or gold I have none. What I have. So they didn't give at that point. Material. But the first act we saw here. The New Testament giving was all. Now let me explain something to you here. Was Peter from the tribe of the Levitical? No. Was John was from that tribe? No. Was Christ from that tribe? If you read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 7, let's go back. Because when Christ died, he did so much more than we know. Let's go to Hebrews chapter. No, no, no. Ephesians 4 7. Ephesians 4 7. Is somebody understanding these things? Ephesians 4 7. Fantastic. But to each one of us is giving grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Next verse. For therefore he says, when he what? Ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave what? Gifts. Next verse. Now he ascended. What does it mean when he first ascended? Descended into the lower parts of the earth. Next verse. Verse 11. He himself gave some to be what? Some. 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 Some, let me tell you what happened when Christ died and he descended and then ascended that Levitical order was done away with so John did not have to come from a Levitical priesthood God by himself now select and pick so because your father is a pastor does not mean you are called to be a pastor now there is a new order of selection and the way which the tithe is now offered up is through this order now that's why the first act of giving in, in Act chapter 4 was that they brought it where? To the apostles' feet. So your apostolic house can collect your tithes. Did you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah. Your apostolic house can collect your tithes. Glory be to God. So God Christ just broke that pattern up. Let me close with this. Hebrews 8 verse 1. Let's look at 8 verse 1 quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody shout, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hebrews 8 1. Let's read this quickly. One, two, ready, go. Now, this is the main point of the things that we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. Next verse. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle with the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is what? Appointed to what? Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. When an high priest shows up, what must he bring? What are the gifts? Your gifts and sacrifices. When Jesus goes before God, let me show you something. Let's look at that scripture. Matthew chapter 14 verse 16. No, let's read this first. Let's complete it. Let's complete it. Matthew, let's complete it. Oh, glory to God. I heard a, sp- a word in my spirit, so I need to close now. The, Lord, the Holy Spirit just said to me now, it is time. Because the Lord told me, listen to this. He said, I'm going to place a new anointing for money. That's why I said I wanted to lay hands. I wanted to listen to me very closely. And I heard the word of the Lord say it is time. So it means I need to close this up now. 
Ferramanto Shikatalamaya. Thank you, Jesus. I see the glory of the Lord. Just pray that for me. I'm praying the Spirit, please. I see the glory. So play that for me and give me that scripture. Let me close now. Thank you, Jesus. Let me explain it to you. What the Lord said to me today while I was praying. He said, I'm going to put an anointing on everyone that they would be able to see opportunities and seize opportunities. And you see, when you are coming out, don't be quick to fall down. Don't just bah, let the hand touch your head. It's just like, just, bah, uh, come in, let something. Uh, uh, you know, the next doctrine we are going to teach is the ministry of laying on of hands. So you understand why we lay hands. It's not like, go, 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 go. Just, just let something be communicated. He says, stir up the gift that was put by, by the laying on of hands through the presbytery, meaning that there were gifts that can be imparted once hands are laid. And the gift that can be woken up when hands are laid. So I wanted to follow. It says, for if it were on the earth, it would not be a priest, since they are priests who offer gifts according to the Lord. Next verse. See that you make known. And, all right, let's go to that scripture. Mark, Mark. Matthew 14, 16. Matthew 14, 16. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone pray in the spirit under your breath. Just pray in the spirit. Now, now Jesus said to them, this was when he was faced with feeding 5,000 people. So you can see the function of a high priest. He was faced with 5,000 people. Then do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Next verse. And they said to him, we have here what? Out of 5,000 people. They had five. And God said, consecrate that five to me. Give me that five. Next verse, watch it. And he said, bring them here to me. Next verse. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and two fishes. He took the five loaves. Who collects the tithes? The high priest. Who is the high priest? Christ the high priest. And what did he do next? And what? Looking up to heaven. It means he took the gift and gave it to heaven as what? High priest. He looked up to heaven and he said, and what? Talk to me. Have you noticed that every place the tithe was given, there was a blessing? Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Can you see similarity? He gave it and blessed it. What happened next? And he gave the loaves of disciples, and disciples gave the money. Next verse, verse 20. And so they all ate and was what? Filled. Everything that touches the hand of the high priest multiplies. So whenever you are giving in church, just stop coming to dance on the offering basket and not drop it. Be imagining you dropping it in the hands of Jesus so that your high priest takes it before God and so that the thing can multiply. Are you getting what I'm talking about here? Luke chapter 11 verse 42. Jesus spoke about tithing there. I will continue this teaching. There's so much more I want to say. I will continue this teaching next week. Were you blessed? Do you have a better understanding? Now, lift your two hands up and pray in the spirit. Shout yes, 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 yes. Somebody shout yes. I'm ready. 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 Opportunities, opportunities, I'm 
Mako Toko Yokobo, Ramatoko Palamande, Saka Topaya Lamanka, Keramato Payalai, Operamantos, Elepokondos, Keramaka. One more minute, one more minute, one more minute, one more minute. One more minute. One more minute. The rebel for Samaya. The rebel Shaya. The rebel for Sobodo. Listen. Listen. If you watch Wise Up uh, Audacity with Pierce on, on Monday, were you blessed by that? I spoke about ideation. If you observe the journey God is taking us through, I spoke about ideation by the Holy Ghost, and I'm talking about this right here. Does it show you something in the realm of the Spirit that something's about to happen? As I lay my hands this day, I tell you by the Holy Ghost, you will see where your waters are. Yeah. A guy, a guy, pardon me, was beside a well of water, and the do- and the sun was dying there, even though the water was right before her. The angel of the Lord came and said, "Can't you see? Open your eyes. It's right before you." Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watches over his city. One more minute, pray in the Holy Ghost. At Wise Up Tuesday, I want to say by the Spirit. I said Wise Up Tuesday. Oh, that's still with PS. A man of God shared a story about a particular person who came to him, Baba Deboe, came to him and said, Sir, um, I want to buy the cows. Every redemption, um, conversion, I want to be the one to buy the cows. I mean, I mean it's a lot of money. It enters into hundreds of millions. So he said, Pray for me, sir. So Baba Debe prayed for the guy, and he went to work. The next week, they sacked him from work. He came back to him and said, sir, I only, you only prayed for me last week. Now they are sacking me this week. And Baba Debe laughed. And he said, do you think it's this salary you are using? <laughs> do you think it's this salary? <laughs> How much it means to buy this thing? It's under it's in this your 50k salary is what no before Christ ascended, he descended. He said, Don't cry, don't be feeling like he said, No, those things that you see are effects. Open your eyes, they are effects that there is pressure in the realm of the spirit, they are effects that something is about to happen. So some of you, your current job cannot give you the kind of money that you want to give to God. God needs to give you a new idea. It doesn't mean you will leave the job, but it needs to open up a new portal by the Spirit. I tell you other God, by whom the whole family never known his name, as I lay my hands on you today, that eyes that sees, that eyes that sees, that sees and sees. Oh yeah. Listen, listen. Take that word. See and cease. That's the word of the Lord. See, I see and I cease. Put it everywhere in your spirit, in your mind. Oh, I see and I cease. Because there are people who see but don't cease. You will see and you will cease. You will see and you will seize those opportunities. Lift your two hands and pray very loud.
We hope you were greatly blessed by today's message because God still has so much He wants to share with you. So stay connected every week to experience uplifting and life-changing moments in His presence.